And essentially what's going on is we are pulling from the scriptures. Here's what, what will, will become, become our articles of faith. The reason why we're not just reviewing our articles of faith, but why we're actually looking at what the scripture says about the things that we believe is because we're in the process through this next uh, year, uh, 8 to 12 months, of actually forming a new church here. So the members of Iola Baptist Temple that attend here, that, that assemble here, that meet here, uh, this work will be... Um, ordained and, and sent out as a, as a brand new work, a brand new church, right, under the name of Kansas City Baptist Church. And so that's kind of what we're working toward. Um, and so what we're doing is going through and actually looking at not just an article of faith that we can adopt from another church or, or a uh, affiliation or some kind of, a, uh, uh, some kind of a, a convention that we can adopt to be our own, we're just looking at this with brand new eyes. I mean, honestly, I'm excited to be able to just kind of look at the church that we have as a grassroots kind of a, a, an assembly, okay, as people who are excited about loving the Lord, as people who are excited about doing His work, especially people who are excited about going out and soul winning and preaching the gospel and seeing what it is that we believe and how that is drawn from the Bible and what it is that we'll stand on, not just today or tomorrow, but Lord willing, for a long time, okay? Articles of faith in a church do not change. Uh, another document that churches often uh, run by is called the bylaws, and those are basically the way that we can govern ourselves and the, the things that, 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 how the working of the church goes. Bylaws can be amended, they can be changed, they can be adapted as to, you know, times and places and cultures and peoples. Articles of Faith is timeless, and it's because it comes from the Word of God. So we started out with the series talking about the church. What is the church? We're building a church. We're working on a church. We don't want to do anything contrary to what the Lord is building and what He's putting together. So we, we understood and we outlined what a church was. We started talking about the pure Word, the Word of God. That was the second sermon in the series, the pure Word. Everything that we believe comes from the Word of God or lines up with the Word of God, especially to say nothing is contrary to the Word of God that we do or that we believe. Uh, also, we need to know that the authority that we have and that we can go back to in the Bible is sufficient for us. Those are the ones that say, uh, you know, well, well, we'll talk, but first put down your Bible and then we'll have a conversation. That doesn't line up. That doesn't stack up and that doesn't work for us because everything that we believe needs to be uh, in line with what the pure Word of God says. Nothing added to, nothing taken away. Thirdly, we talked about the true God. Last week uh, was the series about the true God. We were talking about the Trinity primarily, and we were talking about uh, God from creation, the creator, all the way through. And that's where this is picking up today, is actually taking off from that. The title of the sermon today is Jesus Specifically. Okay, so we're talking about a second part, a second person of the Trinity, but understanding that it is a unified, true in God that we serve. All right, that we were created under a trinity, a true in God, three in one. And of course, we substantiate this, we back this up with 1 John 5, 7. It's a very easy verse uh, that we all know and we have memorized. It says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, I'm going to draw from this with some other well-known verses that we have. You can stay there in Colossians. Uh, we're going to be right there, um, particularly in verse uh, 15. In talking about Jesus, we know that uh, Colossians... Uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? So this is the Jesus that we're talking about, okay? And so in John 1, 1, we know it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. So this is Jesus in the very beginning as the Word, with God. At creation. And then in 1 and 14 it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the thing that we need to understand here, talking about Jesus specifically, and what our church understands is that Jesus was not created by God. Okay, Jesus was not created in the manger in Bethlehem. Okay, Jesus, the part of the Trinity that we associate to the Son, always was there, always was with God. He was not created, but the Word became flesh. And that's what we believe. That's what we need to believe, that He, the Word, became flesh. Okay? In Colossians 1.15, of course, we, we read that. It says, it's talking about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, what does it talk about to be the firstborn of every creature? We'll say, people will say, see, He was created because He is the firstborn of of every creature. Look at firstborn like preeminence, like not necessarily in an order of 
of uh, lineage, but of rank. Jesus Christ is over all. He is the top dog. He is the, the most preeminent. I'm not sure if that's exactly the right word, but I'm going to use it. He's the very top, okay? Jesus Christ is that firstborn. He was there. Also, you might hear some people say, and I don't disagree with it, that's a way, uh, another good way to, to think about how Jesus Christ works into the Trinity is we see him as the Son of God, but also the Son, uh, God the Son, right? The Son of God and God the Son. They're not contradictory. You think, well, you're saying the same thing, just flipping it around. Well, maybe I am, but the Trinity mixes people up, okay? Jesus Christ mixes people up when they try to figure out who he is and where he came from. You see what I'm saying? And so that's why we're laying this out. So the series here today, I've got a lot of scripture. We're not going to go real deep. In fact, there's a lot more scripture we could turn to, but we're going to show from the Bible, from the beginning to the end, who this Jesus is. So the first thing that I want to look at here is we're in Colossians chapter 1. In uh, verses 9 and 10, it says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I want everybody to know that we're not born with all the knowledge of God. And as a saved person, you're not saved with all the knowledge of God. We're saved with enough knowledge that God gives us to be able to trust his word, to understand who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us, which was died on the cross for the remission of sins. That's what it takes to get saved. That's what it takes to put our faith in him. From then on, we have a work right? And it involves prayer. It involves discipleship. It involves investment from other people. It involves attendance in, in the assembly. It involves work in the ministry. And all these things over time impart unto us the knowledge of God, the things that we need to know concerning God and how, who he is and how he loves us and the way he works. And you know what? We're never going to have it all figured out. But it's not something that you can convince somebody of at their doorstep, all right? When you go out and we're talking to somebody and they just flat out are going to say, well, I just don't believe that God, uh, that Jesus is Lord. Well, you know what? We can show them the scriptures. But at the end of the day, they're not going to be able to, to fully, you know, rationalize in their mind how it logically makes sense. And then they can put their trust in him. You can't convince a man like that, right? These things are mysterious to us. But we do have scriptures that are very clear pointing out exactly who Jesus is. So I just like to maybe, you know, emphasize that, that we increase in the knowledge of God as time goes on, right? Nobody's arrived. Nobody's there yet. Nobody needs to feel bad because they don't have it all figured out. You know what? Every saved person starts at the same place. And it doesn't matter if you were five or 50 when you got saved. We all start at the same place. And we walk from there. We grow from there, okay? So continuing on there, in verse 13, I want to look at this through 22. Because we're talking specifically here about, about Jesus, okay? <clears throat> what we see here, of course, this is a letter to the saints. This is going to save people. And it's talking about prayers for fullness of knowledge, for fullness in wisdom, for fullness in understanding concerning spiritual matters. And just to say this, it can only come after salvation by the Holy Spirit, okay? That's how these things are understood. A, a person that's not even saved is going to have a hard time trying to understand all the deep things, all the mysteries, okay? So we'll just get that right out of the way first. <clears throat> but uh, with verse 10 talking about um, uh, increasing in the knowledge of God, but in 13, what do we see here? He says, he's talking about Jesus specifically. It says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So the thing that we need to know about Jesus Christ here is that we have redemption uh, forgiveness of sins and redemption through his blood. And who is this Jesus? It says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. So here you see it defined how Jesus being the firstborn is over all, even principalities and powers. It's not just things that were created physically, but principalities and powers are the, the governing forces over things, over peoples, okay? And Jesus Christ is over that. In 17, it says, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. The only way this is even possible is because he was there at creation. 
Okay, he didn't just show up one day and just assume this position. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should, be all, full, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. The reconciliation comes by Jesus Christ, and he is the head of the church. So that being said, this isn't something that we can just take lightly. Okay, this isn't something that we can just throw around like some kind of a universal church where it's like you believe what you want about Jesus, you believe what you want about Jesus, and you know what, we're all sons of God. No, nope, it doesn't work that way, okay? The Bible very specifically talks about Jesus Christ and who he is, and we need to know that he is the head of the church, right? The pastor is not the head of the church. He may be a leader of the congregation. He may be one that people can look to. Uh, he definitely should be an example, but the head of the church is Jesus Christ, it's not, it's not even somebody over, the, over the, the pastor, but that's under Jesus Christ, like the head of a denomination or the pope or anything like this. There, there is nobody else like that. It's Jesus Christ is the head, okay? So think about this now. Uh, as we walk, as we grow, as we learn more, um, there are deep things that we're going to learn about Jesus. There's deep things that you're going to learn about God as we go. But I've got five points here breaking down the basics to understand who Jesus is. So I'll try to get through these pretty quickly. Again, there's nothing really uh, deep or, or heavy on this, but there's definitely some things that we need to understand. So the first point that we're going to get into here is that Jesus was the Word at creation. Now, we've already covered this. I covered this last week, and I even read already Genesis. Um, uh, uh, we talked about the Genesis and the, and the John account. But just looking here at what it says here, I, I, I need to emphasize, and I want to cover this, that Jesus was not just a prophet. Okay, there are those out there that say Jesus was a good guy. You know, they'll say, hey, I don't doubt that he existed. You know, I don't doubt that there was a man named Jesus that walked the earth. I don't doubt that there was a man, and if we follow his teachings, and if we follow his example, we'll have a good life. Well, you know what? That might not be a, a, a statement that somebody couldn't make. In fact, I would say that anybody that follows the teachings of Jesus would have a good life on this earth. But I'll tell you what, if they don't get saved, then this life on earth is all they're going to have that's good. Okay? So you can't just you know, believe in a man named Jesus, but not believe that he is who he said he was. So he's not just a prophet, but in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, we do find the prophecy of a coming prophet. So I want to I look at this here. Deuteronomy chapter 18, in, in 20 and 22, 20 through 22, there's, there's, there's confirmation of a false prophet, okay? And you can read a lot here. We're not going to get into it too deep, but what God thinks about false prophets, okay? How God handles false prophets, those who handle the word of God lightly, those who deceive people, okay? The Bible talks a lot about that stuff. But here we have the promise of a true prophet who will be a mediator that may be looked upon and who will speak the words of God. And I'm going to tell you, this is exactly what mankind wants. This is exactly who we want. We want somebody that's a mediator for us between us and God. Okay, we want somebody that we can see, that we can talk to. It says in 15, it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. According to all that thou decide, desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see his great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him. We are talking about the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is this referencing here? This is referencing back in Exodus 20 when Moses is delivering the commandments and the children of Israel have seen the thunderings, they've heard the lightnings, they've seen the, the earth shaking and all the rumblings, and you know what? They're terrified of God. I'm afraid today that there's just people that aren't terrified of God anymore. We, we have this romantic version, okay, this children's Bible version of who God is, 
is, okay, that it's all rainbows and unicorns and clouds up in heaven, and God's just frolicking about, you know, um, you know, loving everybody in this, in this fancy way. But what happened when God was talking to Moses on the mount? It was terrifying. And you know what they said? We actually don't even want to see God face to face. That scared us to death right here is what just happened, okay? And you know what he says? He says, well, well have they spoken. God should, sh we should be fearful of God in that way, okay? It's not unreasonable to say that. If we had that kind of a, a, of a fear towards God, you know what we would do more? As, as people on this earth, we would respect God more, okay? We would revere God more, right? We would obey God more if we really understood who he was and what his expectations were. So this is what they've said. They're terrified of this. They've, they've seen the thunderings. They're scared. They don't want to face him lest they die. So there's this promise here of a coming prophet that will speak in his name. Now, Jesus Christ is this prophet, and Jesus Christ is our mediator. He is the one whose words we can turn to to expound on not just the Old Testament, but even the prophecy that he gives you can see it laid out many different ways that we can break it down and understand it, okay? The Bible is not written in such a way that you have to have a doctorate in theology to understand what's going on here, okay? Jesus wants us to know. God wants us to know the things that are written in this book, and we can understand them. Jesus is our mediator. Now, um, you know, just, just kind of going on from this, in Acts 3 and 17, it quotes Deuteronomy in verses 20 and 23. If you look there in Acts 17, <clears throat> Acts 17, uh, Acts 3, I'm sorry, Acts 3, verse 17 through 26, <clears throat> what's it say here? It says, and now, brethren, I want <clears throat> that through ignorance you did it, <clears throat> also and now, brethren, I wot that through the ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But these things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Jesus Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. So the prophecy of Jesus Christ, the thing that goes back all the way even to the Old Testament prophets, Jesus Christ fulfilled. And verse 19 says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you, and it shall come to pass that every soul which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. What do we know? What does John 14, 6 say? Jesus is the way. Jesus is the prophet. Jesus has the words of life. Jesus is the one. It says, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. It goes on from there, even through uh, 26. But what do we see here? We see here that uh, uh, Jesus Christ is, is the prophet that was prophesied. But he is not just a prophet, okay? He's not just a prophet like Muhammad. He's not just a false prophet, Muhammad is. He's not just a prophet like people will claim Joseph Smith and others to be, okay? He's not just a prophet like uh, even any uh, maybe prosperity preachers or, uh, or things like that, men promoting a, a false gospel or a false doctrine. He is the prophet, but more so, he is the Lord. He was the prophesied one, okay? He is the mediator. In, in John 740, do we not know? It says, of a truth, this is the prophet, okay? So when somebody wants to come to you and say, well, I believe that Jesus was a prophet. It's like, okay, I can see how they're, how they're saying that. I can see where that comes from. But truly, they're cutting him short, okay? Truly, they're cutting off who he is. He's not just a prophet. Uh, now, the Bible talks about prophets and true prophets, what we see here, I mean, even in Isaiah, we, we find that uh, a prophecy. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, you've got minor prophets, all these kinds of prophets, okay? So was Jesus, you know, just like those? Was he just another prophet? Some think so. Some think he was just like that. You know, we have their words and we have his words, okay? There's modern prophets today. 
Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but even when we're out soul winning, when we're out preaching the gospel, when we're out telling people the truth of the Bible, that in a sense is prophecy. You say, well, wait a minute now. We're not foretelling the future. You know, we definitely don't want to be a false prophet. Well, I'll tell you what, when you're telling people what the word of God says, that's not telling people wrong. And when you're telling people even things that are going to happen in the future that the Bible says, then that's not wrong. Okay. <clears throat> so how does this work? That we're prophets, because if you look even in a, a modern definition of a prophet, it's a person regarded as an inspired teacher or proclaimer of the will of God. Now, I tell you what, that's exactly what we're doing when we go soul winning. I want to go out there and I want to tell people what the will of God is, right? And God is not willing that anyone should perish, right? God wants everybody to get saved. So we go out there and we look at these. And of course, there's false prophets. And as I said, you know, in Deuteronomy and other places, Jesus lays out, God lays out exactly how he deals with false prophets. Um, but you know what? Jesus here was foretold as the prophet that was coming. But as we're going to see, even continuing on in the sermon, you can't stop there. You can't just call him a prophet, a good man, okay? Now, talking about the prophecy of Jesus brings us to our second point here. Jesus was prophesied to come. Now, we'll look at two passages here, um, and they're, they're a little bit lengthy, but if you look in Isaiah chapter 7, we'll read just a few verses, and then Isaiah 53. <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 7, Verses 10 through 14, it says, Moreover, the Lord spake unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? Uh, but will ye weary God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You see, well, there you go. That's a perfect example of how it doesn't say that Jesus is coming. It says Emmanuel. Well, here we go. What is Emmanuel? Emmanuel is God with us. Okay, so it does say that Jesus is coming, and it does say that Jesus is Lord. Okay, Emmanuel is not a name, you know, that we need to fuss over, you know, uh, like so many others. So it was not just prophesied that he would show up someday, but the prophecy being as specific as here's your sign. Here's what you can look for. Okay, so let me just ask you, how many people have been born to a virgin? Lots, right? No, not at all. In fact, never has been and never can be because it's a miracle. It's a miraculous thing for this to happen. So any other coming, claiming this type of, a, of an entrance is a liar, is a false prophet, is a devil. Okay, couldn't be this way. So this is the, his entrance into this world. And in Isaiah 53... If we look at this, because Jesus Christ, I mean, he was prophesied, his prophecy not only talks about, you know, who he was at the beginning, but him coming into this world and even leaving this world also. And it goes on beyond, which we'll see at the end of the sermon here. But in Isaiah 53, <clears throat> I'm going to turn it here. In Isaiah 53, what do we find? It says, who hath, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry, dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, we're talking about Jesus here, okay, we're talking about 750 years before he walked on the earth, okay. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb into the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. 
Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. There is no one else this is speaking of than the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, this is exactly what he did. And this was prophesied, and this was fulfilled. Okay, this is exactly what happened. There's many that would say, well, you know, I don't believe that that's what happened. I don't believe that that's, you know, how it played out. I think that there's uh, uh, bad actors. I think that there's, you know, lies and deception with this. This is what the Bible says. And as we already established, I can't, I can't go from, from anything else than this. And if there's anything that speaks contrary to this, which am I going to choose? It's an easy choice. We go with what the Bible says. Okay, so this is Jesus Christ who did these things, who paid for your sin and mine. And he knew he was going to pay for your sin and mine. And he came and he took, he took our sin upon himself. That's who Jesus is. So part, what, what allowed him to do this was the miraculous virgin birth. Now this virgin birth, as I already mentioned, was impossible uh, without, without the miracle of God. Right? There's nobody else that has been uh, born this way, and this birth was foretold and fulfilled. The Bible is very clear about that. Okay? So we need to understand this. Now, I'm not going to turn to them, but you could, if you want to, if you're unclear on exactly how uh, Jesus um, was born of a virgin and came to earth, uh, in Matthew 1, 18 through 25 is a historical account. In Luke 1, 28 through 35 is a historical account, particularly verse 33. So we can turn there. For time's sake, uh, we're not going to read all those passages. I trust that we read our Bibles and that we are pretty familiar with those passages. I don't want to assume anything, um, but the addresses are there that you can bookmark. Uh, you can turn to them later, and you can find out you know, just what history says uh, how Jesus came. So... The fourth point that I want to look at is Jesus' earthly life proved his deity. Okay, so he came of a virgin, was born, grew up, and lived a life on earth. And the life that he lived proved his deity. Okay, so it, it doesn't disprove it. The hundreds of prophecies that he had to fulfill are, are staggering. I mean, for, for anybody to fulfill any kind of a prophecy like this, to do a couple of them would be miraculous, okay? In fact, to do one of them, you'll hard-pressed find anybody that has lucked into fulfilling a prophecy, okay? But to fulfill the many prophecies of Jesus Christ and throughout his lifetime is immeasurably miraculous, okay? So his earthly life proves his deity. Now, here in this point, rather than reading each miraculous account, I just want to read a couple of passages here, okay? There again, I trust that we've gone through and we can read uh, the Gospels and we can see what Jesus has done. We can see his miracles, his healings, um, the ones that he rose from the dead, the power that he had, the wisdom that he had. We can see those in each account. But I just want us to look in John chapter 10. John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, 24 through 30, it says, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So what do you know? We need, we need, just tell us. Just tell us flat out, point blank. Are you the Christ or what? You know? But how, how many people do we talk to that say, you know what, if I just had a little bit of proof, if I just had a little bit of evidence? Well, I tell you, there's people that are looking Jesus Christ in the face and asking him, yet believe not. Okay? And then add to that, well, if they just show me a sign, I mean, if I just see a miracle, then I would believe. Well, what is it that we see here? He says, I told you and you believe me not, and the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. 
right? So he says, it is clear as day who I am. You've got no grounds to doubt what I'm telling you, okay? But ye believe not, because you're not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father am one. Then uh, the Jews took up stones to stone him, and it goes on from there. So what do we see? Again and again and again, claiming who he is, stating who he is, okay? They hung him on the cross because, uh, because of who he was or because of who he said he was, right? Both sides of it are illustrated there in his crucifixion. Uh, but the things that he said infuriated them because he was God. The truths that he spoke were unmovable and it infuriated them, okay? Jesus is not a respecter of persons and it infuriated them. Okay, yet Bible preachers today want to appeal to everybody, want to try to attract everybody. Even we as soul owners have to be careful about this because you go out there and we're not looking to make enemies. We want to get people saved, right? And have you heard it? Uh, you can attract more flies with honey than vinegar, right? So, you know, we're just going to go out there and be nice. But how many go out there trying to preach the gospel and they're so nice they can never even ask the hard questions? right? They're so nice, they don't even want to get anybody upset or flustered. They're so nice, they don't want to interrupt somebody who's a little bit busy. Well, I tell you what, I don't know what somebody could be more busy with than getting saved for all eternity, okay? I don't know who wouldn't want to stand out in the rain and hear the gospel because if they're not saved for all eternity, they're going to be begging for a drop of rain. They would, they would, they will beg for a drop of rain wrung out of the soul winner's sock, from walking on a rainy day when they're burning in hell, right? So I don't know what's more important than getting saved, but we need to be careful not to be so gentle and so timid that we can't stand on the Word of God and preach it boldly. And Jesus was not well liked for, for this fact, for the truth that he spoke and the truths that he preached. And, and no, even when, when he told them who he was, it, it infuriated them, and, and they believed not. And when it talks about being, in the, being of the sheep here and being of the fold and being a son of God, this is not talking about some predestination thing or, or predetermined thing or, or something where, oh, well, I tried winning these ones to the Lord, and they're not believing, and the reason they're not believing is because God never put them in the fold. God never said that they would be saved. That's not, exact, that, that's not at all what the Bible is saying, okay? Anyone can get saved. Everyone needs to determine who their Lord is, and everyone can see from the Bible who Jesus was and decide to put their faith in him. Absolutely any person. Okay? Now, as we know, there are haters of God, and it goes on from there, those who will not desire to uh, have the Lord as their Savior. There are ones who will not desire to walk after him. There are those who God has turned over to a reprobate mind, but that's not what this is talking about here. Okay? This is not talking about somebody who would desire to know God want to know God, and he has cut them off. That's not uh, how the Lord works. The second thing that I want to look at here, um, which actually we're in, we're in uh, John 10, but I would encourage you, if you're still a little bit unclear on Jesus' own words regarding him and the Father, put your bookmark in John 14 and read the whole chapter. Okay, John 14 is a fantastic passage for you to read on your own time and really ponder what Jesus says about the Father and his relationship, okay? But for now, let's go to Philippians 2, and we'll read 4 to 11. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. <clears throat> Now, we're talking about the mind of Christ. And I'll tell you what, for unity, we all would do well to have the mind of Christ, okay? In this body, we all would do well to have this mind and, and to have Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in us personally that we can get along. What does it say here, in, uh, starting in 4? It says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man on also the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Now, focus here on who is Jesus, okay? There's, there is a teaching here, a teaching that we all can understand and apply but who is Jesus? In verse 6, it says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him 
the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We see Jesus Christ and we see the Father here. And I want to I wanna really hit on something here. It says here, uh, the form of God. Now, what we're talking about here is the Word, Jesus being the Word, the Word in the Trinity, the true in God, the Word perfectly aligned with the Father and the Spirit becoming flesh. <clears throat> he lived and he dies being God the Son, his very existence proving his deity, fulfilling prophecies foretold, taking on the name that all men will confess. <clears throat> and what is the confession? The confession that all men will make is that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the confession, okay? So I love seeing that. When you'll see a billboard or a sign or a yard sign or a bumper sticker that says Jesus is Lord, what a statement that is, okay? Jesus is Lord. <clears throat> but we're not going to rip that from the Trinity. We're not going to rip Jesus out of the true in God, right? So what does it say here talking about the form of God? Now, the form here, okay, I want to break this down a little bit because some people might not understand and we really get hung up here on how... Jesus, who was the Word, came down. And if you've ever had somebody ask you, I just don't understand how, how you say that he was 100% God and 100% man, right? Has anybody ever tried to uh, uh, say that to somebody, you know? He's not half God and half man, okay? He's not mostly God and some man, okay? He's 100% God and he's 100% man. It's because what we see here is the form of God. Now, the form, the word form here means uh, having all attributes, having all attributes, okay? So he had the form of God. So this is in the complete unity of God, but we also see that he was the form of a servant. This is the complete man, okay? He had, he had all the attributes of a man, don't we know? He was in the likeness of man, which is to say, this isn't a hard definition here, he was just like a man, right? He was just like you and me. You say, I don't know that he was just like us. I mean, he was God. To say that he's just like us, doesn't that kind of take away from his deity? Doesn't that kind of pull him away from God? Well, let me tell you, don't you know that he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin? Amen. He was tempted. That's just like me. Don't we know that he wept? Don't we know that he bled? Don't we know that he hungered and that he thirsted? Don't we know that he wearied and that he was strengthened by God? Why would he need strengthened by God if he wasn't just like us, okay? He took on the form of a man. And then don't we know also in Hebrews 2 and 7, what does it say that he was created lower than the angels? Why? That he would be crowned with honor and glory. He wasn't just an angel that came to earth. He didn't walk miraculously and angelic and have some supernatural spiritual resurrection, he had a bodily resurrection. He had a physical resurrection because he was like man. He was a man in his likeness, okay? But he was 100% God. He was a third part of the Trinity, the true in God. I keep saying the true in God, and that's three in one is, is what triune means. Tri is three in one, triune, okay? Or Trinity or three in one is, is why I keep saying that. <clears throat> notice that through his humble intercession as a servant, he exalted everybody. He exalted all. He, he exalted everybody. <clears throat> and how did he do that? Of course, through his, through his death, the death on the cross. So that brings us to our fifth point here, Jesus' payment for sin. In 1 John 2.2, 2, if you look in 1 John, back at the back of the Bible, 1 John chapter 2, <clears throat> says, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So what's propitiation, propitiation mean there? It is the act of appeasing a God, a spirit, or a person. You can propitiate something, okay? So it, it pleased God for him to do that. 
okay? He is the per propitiation for our sins because our sins create a great gulf between us and God, because our sins separate us from God, because our sins are what has always separated man from God, starting all the way back in the Bible, in uh, Genesis, okay? Jesus Christ is the propitiation, okay? He is the atonement. He is the one that, I don't want to say makes it all better, because that seems kind of an, an elementary way to say that, but think about it. He's the only one that can do that. You can't do that. I can't do that. I can't atone for my sins. I can't propitiate to God for the sins that I do on a regular basis, okay? But Jesus Christ can, and Jesus Christ did. The sins of the whole world include us, and that is through Jesus Christ, okay? It's not through any other than Jesus Christ, okay? In Galatians 3.11 through 14, if you look in Galatians chapter 3, we'll look at a couple of verses here. Starting in 11 of Galatians chapter 3, it says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. People want to say, you know, prove to me that God exists. Prove to me that I, that I can trust God. It's by faith. It's by faith. That's the only way that anybody gets saved is by faith. People that say that they are a pretty good person, that they don't do too much bad stuff, that they've never killed anybody, they think they've got a shot of getting into heaven. It says right there, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, right? You might be justified in, in a court of law on earth. You might be justified in my eyes. But you know what? Before God, no man is justified by the law. Verse 12, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. It's through faith. So what is it that we're receiving through faith? We're receiving the atonement for sins. We're receiving the blessing of Abraham. We're receiving sonship through our faith in Jesus Christ. If you look just right over in chapter 4 of Galatians, verses 3 through 5, it says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of, of His Son, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And it goes on from there, talking about uh, sonship. But for time's sake here, we need to understand that the Son redeemed those that were under the law uh, and made us to become sons. We are sons of God, right? Matthew uh, chapter 20, verse 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came, to not, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. Right? For many. And of course, just thinking about this, you know, we, we just read uh, Isaiah 53, but that is exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and me. That is exactly how he did these things. That's exactly how he, how it, it pleased the Father to bruise him. Okay? <clears throat> but if that were the end of the story, that wouldn't be the full gospel, would it? Because that just takes us through the death of Jesus Christ. And the death, the, the gospel is the good news. And the good news is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? So there's ones that may, maybe they say, well, I believe that, that he was a man. You know, I believe that he was a good guy and that he walked on the face of the earth. And I believe that he died. I mean, you know, nobody's still alive thousands of years later, so he must have died. But there's just no way that he could have resurrected. Or, or I mean, maybe those that say, you know what? I believe that people talk about a resurrection, but there's just no way that it was a bodily resurrection. I mean, what it was, was it was just a spiritual thing. I mean, you know, it, it wasn't actual physical you know, and, uh, and so it was just spiritual. Well, the, the thing with that is that Jesus' resurrection is pretty much a big deal, okay? And even in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we quote on a regular basis when we're out soul winning, because the reason why we quote this verse so often is because people really have no idea what the word gospel even means. They really have no idea what the good news even means. Uh, they think that they've heard the gospel their whole life, but then when we ask them if they're sure they're going to heaven and what are they trusting in, they say, well, you know, being a good person or going to church or, you know, reading my Bible or following the commands or, you know, doing these types of things. 
it's clear that they're not trusting in the gospel. And the gospel, as we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, many of you have it memorized. I know it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. So how are we, stand, how are we saved? By the gospel, by believing the gospel, okay? It is declared, it is preached, it is received, and we stand on the gospel. So verse 2 says, By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, I'm just going to add this in here. This is not somebody that was saved and lost their salvation. This isn't somebody who used to believe and then doesn't believe. Somebody that believes in vain never believed, okay? They never put their faith in. It's like if I'm going to tell somebody, hey, the sky is actually purple, it's not blue. And you're going to be like, okay, I can see how you'd say the sky is purple, but not blue. But then later on, you're like, no, the sky is not, not, not purple. It's blue. It's always been blue. I've always known it was blue. They're believing in vain. I know that's a bad illustration, a bad example. I'm going to be honest with you. Almost all illustrations of things that the Bible says clearly fall short. Just go with what the Bible says clearly. Amen. But anyway, so he says that those, uh, unless you believed in vain, that's where we're standing on. Uh, we're standing on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And what is it that he also received and that we also received in the message that we preach to people that they need to receive and that they can take with them and that they can have standing on? It says how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So many people, you know, when you ask them, so why did Jesus die? Lots of people will say, for our sins. Okay, that's very common that they will say, he died for our sins, okay? And that's exactly right. I'm thankful that they've got some kind of a, a background where they at least know that there's a man named Jesus, and he died on the cross, and the Bible says it was for our sins. And that's exactly right. But it doesn't just stop there. There's people who believe that he died for their sins, but then they're still trying to live a certain way. They're still trying to make right for the sins. They're still trying to repent of the sins that they commit every single day and attribute that to salvation or righteousness with God. What does it say? He died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And you say, why is this such a big deal? I mean, if you get most of it, don't you get all of it? Well, if you look down in verse 17, so let's say in verse 17, <clears throat> where am I at? Am I even... <clears throat> We're in... Uh, uh, Oh, 1 Corinthians, see, I'm still in Galatians, right? So what does it say in verse 17? It says, ye are yet in your sins. Ye are yet, all right, if there is no resurrection, okay? If all these people, because it goes on there in 1 Corinthians to say, and then he was seen of, uh, of Cephas and, and, uh, and then above the 500, and all these brothers saw him. This is a firsthand witness account here, okay? So if they're all lying and everybody's lying, then that means that you're lying and that means that I'm lying, okay? It means that what we're saying isn't true, Okay, it means that we're out there preaching a, a false resurrection. But he says, if there is no resurrection, then ye are yet in your sins. Sin is not atoned for if Jesus Christ did not resurrect. And you've heard it said, people joke about it. They say, well, if Jesus didn't resurrect, then produce the body. Isn't that all anybody would have ever had to do is produce a body? But it's never been done. There is no body because, not because it was taken and consumed, not because it was hid in secrecy. They're not going to be able to come back even a thousand years from now and say, we have scientifically identified these remains as those of Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen because he's not here. Right. Amen? Because he resurrected. He rose from the dead. And if there is no resurrection, then ye are yet in your sins. Wouldn't we not be the most miserable people if that was the case? If we think that we have salvation and come to find out we don't? That's a heartbreaking thing. But what is it that we're trusting in? We're not trusting in our good works. We're not trusting in being a good person. We're not trusting in going to church to be saved. We're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is who he said he was. He came to this earth. He died on the cross. He rose again. And he's alive today, by the way. Fictitious or figmented uh, uh, idea that we have about, about this, uh, what do they call it, sky daddy. Okay, he's alive today. You ever heard anybody say that at the door? It's laughable, okay? Without the resurrection, all of mankind would be dead in sin. <coughs> we would be found to be liars, along with the hundreds that saw him in, uh, in, the, in that biblical account right there. Now, the second thing here, we're going to move on to point number seven. Um, <coughs> and actually, let me just say, 
talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, talking about this actual historical account here, and I'm not going to turn to these verses, but like I did before, I want to give you the addresses to them. You can look in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 7, and you can look in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 7. If you want to see specifically the biblical historical account of these things happening, okay? I'm not glossing over them uh, to skirt anything, but for time's sake, we're going to move on. But I want you to know that there is those accounts, and that is what we believe. That is what we stand on, okay? is the historical account. <clears throat> now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you're there, good on you. I should have turned there, but I didn't. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to continue. If we look, we'll read 15 through 28. <clears throat> and we're going to really emphasize, uh, we're going to hit on verse 28. I want to expound on that just a little bit. But to get down there, we'll start... In, uh, we'll start in verse 20. It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then <clears throat> cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he, hath, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which, is, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So I'm going to break this down here, because this can be not a little bit confusing, but maybe not very well understood. So I'll do my best here to try to expound on this just a little bit. <clears throat> but what we see here is actually the order of the resurrection and the Son being finally under subjection of the Father. And I'm going to tell you this is not derogatory. I'm not telling you here in some sense that Jesus Christ is, is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord, but he's only Lord for now, and then later he won't be Lord anymore. That's not at all what we're saying here. And so to say that Jesus Christ will be um, under the subjection of the Father is not derogatory because it says in verse 28, as I mentioned, and this is where we're going to hit on this, it says, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, who is the Father, okay, that God may be all in all. This wouldn't make any sense at all unless God were a trinity, if it were a perfect triune God, right? And what do we see here is that it is put back. It's all in all. So what are the first fruits here? It says Christ, the first fruits. This is the first one eternally resurrected. Okay? There was none other that was eternally resurrected from life on earth before Jesus Christ. Now, there were other resurrections. There was even ones that Jesus Christ had healed or resurrected. But you know what? They're not alive today. They died again at some point. Right? Bible's not even clear on, on a lot of them if any of them, but Jesus Christ is the first fruits, okay? So not the first resurrection, but the first fruits is what is laid out. This, uh, this happened in A.D. 33. Just so there's not anybody that's confused in here, does anybody else get irritated at the B.C. and B.C.E. statements that anybody, everybody makes nowadays? <clears throat> A.D. 33 A.D. does not stand for after death, by the way. I don't know if anybody was raised thinking that there was B.C. before Christ and A.D. was after death. It makes sense if you're looking at the first two letters, but there's like 33 years there that would not be accounted for then. So what A.D. is, is Anno Domini, which is Latin, meaning in the year of our Lord, and B.C. being before Christ. Okay, so that's what B.C. and A.D. stands for. It's a perfectly relevant term that we can use today, and I think we ought to use it today, okay? The reason why they've changed it to B.C. and B.C.E. Uh, and B.C.E. is it's inclusive for the offended, for the ones that don't want to believe in Jesus, that don't want to say that there's a Lord over them, that don't want to say that there's a creator, okay? 
they're offended, and so what they've done is they've changed it to say before common era and common error. And how arrogant is that, isn't it? It's like, what's going on now, and then everything else, right? It's like, we don't even care about all that. It's, it's, it's funny. But what's interesting about that is Jesus Christ is still the factor. Jesus Christ is still the one that changed in A.D., okay? So call it what they want, I suppose, but it still is what it is. So what we've got there is we've got Jesus Christ being the first fruits, okay? This is the order of resurrection. After that is the catching up of the saints at his coming. This is the first resurrection. And this you can find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're not going to turn there for time's sake, but that is where we find what people often refer to as uh, the rapture. That is the first resurrection. Now, <clears throat> the reason why we're looking at this is because this is expounding on the fact that Jesus, being the Son, is under the Father in subjection, but it's in triune unity. Okay, this is not saying that there is three separate gods. This is not saying, as I've already mentioned, I, I hate to just repeat myself, but this isn't saying that God is Lord for now, that Jesus is Lord for now, but then later he's not going to be Lord, or that he's going to hand over his authority to some other God, and then there's some other God over here. It's not like that at all. But it's, it's um, uh, as it says, uh, that God may be all in all there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28. <clears throat> but what do we see there? We see then the end in verse 24. It says, then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. So what we find here is that if we look in uh, Revelation chapter 11, and we can go there, we're not far, in Revelation chapter 11, this lays out after the second, uh, the two witnesses and their death and the resurrection, the great woe, which is the third woe, we see this aligning with the seventh trump and the seventh vial. And actually, we're, I'm not bringing all that into this sermon, but we are, uh, in this series, going to be talking about um, end times <clears throat> and laying some of this out. But in uh, 11 and 14... Starting in 13, it says, In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and, the earthquake were, uh, and in the earthquake were slain men of 7,000, and the remnant were affrightened, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were voices in heaven, great voices in heaven, it says, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So what we're talking about here is a triune God. It does say God and his Christ, but this is not two separate gods. This is unifying. Don't get the idea that Jesus is only Lord for now. Of course, as I've said already, uh, God will be all in all. All things are put under Jesus, everything except the Father, it said there in verse 27. So when it was talking about there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27, it said everything shall be put under him except the one that put everything under him. That's signifying that the Father is not under Jesus Christ. Okay, The Father put everything under Jesus Christ, and then in the end, it will all be reunited again. The authority, the majesty... Um, all put together in the triune God, um, will be all in all, it says. And after death and hell are cast into the lake of fire, don't we know, uh, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Okay, so that's, that's where all this is headed, right? Is that uh, death and hell shall be cast into the lake of fire, which burneth forever and ever, we know it says in uh, Revelation chapter 20, 21. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55, don't we know it says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so the victory that we have is in Jesus Christ. And what is the victory? The victory is of death and of the law, the sting of sin, right? All passed away in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> One last place for us to turn this afternoon is in the book of Revelation. We've followed Jesus Christ from prophecy through his earthly life, ministry. If uh, you can read there, you've bookmarked the passages talking about the miraculous birth. You've bookmarked potentially the verses, the pages talking about the many miracles, turn to the Gospels. 
and read through those and other places. <clears throat> but I want to look in the book of Revelation at the life, uh, at, at Jesus beyond, beyond, beyond our lifetime. It says, uh, the title of this point was Jesus Foretold. Okay, so not just foretold to life, but foretold for eternity. Okay, in Revelation chapter 1, look at verses 1 through 8. And if you put these pieces together, in fact, we'd be wise to note these pieces that we can put them together when we're out, even soul winning and preaching, okay? To, to show people who Jesus is and when he says who he is, that he really means he is who he says he, he is. In Revelation chapter 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. All right, so these things, they're not to be taken lightly, right? These things aren't to be disregarded. People that, that scoff at the Bible, that laugh at the Bible, that think it's a joke, that think it's a fairy tale, it's not to be taken lightly. Okay, verse 4. John to the seven churches in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come from the seven spirits which are before the throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Church, Jesus Christ is Lord. There is no two ways about it. Now, some of you guys out there have a red letter edition, and you're going to start picking up on some of these uh, red letters, and you might think to yourself, if it says, I am Alpha and Omega, why is it written in red? Because it's our Lord Jesus Christ. And for him to say here, Alpha and Omega, of course, the beginning and the end, Jesus Christ is outside of time. Here again, I've mentioned before my own struggles with trying to comprehend time. I'm so bound by time. But don't we even try to even think about this? In fact, even in outlining this sermon, I've got here the, the before the beginning, the life, and, and the future of Jesus Christ. But we already know that Jesus Christ is outside of time. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? He always was and always will be, okay? So he's outside of time. What do we see here? Looking at 9, it says, I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle, which is called Patmos, for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of, of a trumpet saying, now what is this great voice saying, right? This is God saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and Pergamos, and Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I... Turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with paps of a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now, you might, this might sound familiar if you've been reading even through this last couple of weeks on the, on the uh, reading schedule, going through your prophecy, okay? Old Testament prophecy, all right? And his feet like unto brass, as if they were burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun uh, shineth in his strength. <clears throat> and uh, in 17 it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last, I am he that liveth, 
and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of death and hell. Now, some have a hard time believing that Jesus is God the Son, which is the same Godhead with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Some say, show me where Jesus says that he is the Lord, right? Some will tell you this. Now, when I look at the book of Revelation, I think you could point out here, and actually we're going to go to chapter 22 in just a minute, you can point out very clearly just from these two passages that Jesus is Lord, okay? That Jesus is Alpha and Omega, that, that God is a trinity, and it is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But, and we're, we're not even going to turn there, but just overlooking John 10.30, right? Which says, I am the Father, I am one. In 1 Timothy 3.16, where it says God was manifest in the flesh, God was manifest in the flesh, okay? Not just the Word was manifest in the flesh, but it actually says God was manifest in the flesh there, okay? Revelation chapter 1, what we've just seen is this voice that's talking is Jesus saying the Alpha and the Omega. If you look in Revelation chapter 22, real easy to kind of remember where this is because you figure, you know, just go to the last book of the Bible and it lays it out very clearly. Or, I mean, the last page of the Bible. Revelation 22 in 12 says, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Okay, there again, red letters, which I don't believe are inspired, but they're helpful in this sense. It ought to make people wonder anyway. When they read it and they see the red letters, why would they think, uh, I hope that people think, huh, isn't that weird that there's red letters in the book of Revelation? Right? Has anybody ever pondered that? You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but... I remember when I was a young Christian kind of pondering that myself, honestly. You know, wow, red letters in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> but it says here, verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then if you look in 22, 16, it says, I, Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And then if you look in verse 17, what does it say? And the spirit and the bride say, Come. Right? And let them that heareth say, Come. And let him that athirst come. And whosoever will let him take the water. And whosoever, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. So the whole challenge to all this is come to Jesus. It's come to Jesus. Right? People, keep, people want to, you know, have these, these, these crazy philosophies about God. They want to have these, these huge imaginations about God, all the while trying to fit God into their imaginations. But God is outside of our imaginations, right? God is terrible. He is mighty, right? Like, like the children of Israel, when they were, uh, you know, witnessing what was going on up on the mount with Moses, and they see the thunderings and the lightnings, and they say, I'm terrified of God. Make it so that we'll deal with you and not with him. Okay, so people are trying to comprehend this huge God in their, in their own imagination. The Bible says we don't have to do that. We don't have to try to make up who God is. We don't have to try to walk after some huge God like this. You know what we have to do? We can open up the Word of God so easily, right? Somebody who is saved can show someone what the Word of God says, and they can trust Jesus. They can trust Jesus. That's what it says. When it talks about coming and receiving of the water of life, which is freely given, it's come to Jesus, okay? Uh, Brother Dean and I were out yesterday knocking doors in KCK, in KC, Missouri, I'm sorry, Kansas City, Missouri, up there by research. And we were walking down the, the street, and it was raining, by the way, that day, and there's a storm sewer. And Brother, what did it say? It was carved or it was written when the concrete was wet on the top of a storm sewer that said, water should be free. It said, water should be free, right? And then I'm reading the Bible, and it says, whosoever will, let him drink freely of the water. Salvation is free because Jesus Christ paid for it. Brother, I think we ought to go back and, and paint that on the top of that, that drain there. But here's the issue. People need to understand who Jesus is. And that's why we go out soul winning. That's why we go out preaching. We're preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. Right? We're preaching the resurrection. We're preaching the life, the, the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how we have eternal life. And so that's the position of this church. That's, that's how we can say and how we're going to have an article of faith saying that we, as a church, believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the way, that he was uh, 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 there at the beginning at creation, that he uh, was with God. And I didn't even get into, for this particular sermon, 
uh, all the appearances of Jesus through the Old Testament, okay, all the different places where we see Jesus Christ working, all the different, you know, I don't want to say nuance parts of it, but, you know, there's so much. You, you can't open virtually almost any page of the Bible and not see Jesus in there, okay, through the, the stories, the miracles, whatever, okay. We stand on the Word of God and we stand on Jesus Christ and Him being the only way. But the fact that He is Lord and that he's not just prophesied from the beginning and to our generations, to our, to our current day, to the CE, okay, the common era, right? But even beyond the CE, right? Beyond, through all eternity, outside of time, is where Jesus Christ is. So that's what we believe. That's what we stand on. I hope that this sermon isn't uh, confusing in any way. Uh, the overlying factor with all of this, with this series uh, last week being the true God, uh, this week being Jesus specifically, and next week being the Holy Spirit, is that what we see is that it is absolutely unifying of the Trinity. That's the Trinity, and that's, that's the God that we worship. So let's pray today. God in heaven, we love you so much. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the fact that he uh, did, uh, was obedient uh, to come, to live, to die, and to raise again. We're thankful for the salvation that we have simply by trusting him. Thank you, God, for your holy word that is not confusing or hard to understand, but it's a word that can be taught to babes, and it can be believed on by absolutely everyone. So we're thankful, God, today. I pray that you would just be with us as we go, be with the soul winning efforts today, and uh, just continue to do, do a mighty work in this church, the body, and the leadership thereof. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen.